and welcome to yet another edition of your program, Harona. I am Harona Drame. My guest today is a young lady who's just recently returned home to the Gambia. She's experienced in dealing with distressed properties, property management, etc. It's my pleasure to introduce Aida Sisenjai. Thank you. Aida, welcome to the program, Harona. Thank you for having me. So, how you been? How do you find uh, coming back home after all these years? Um, it's a great experience. I like it. Um, takes getting used to certain parts, but there's nothing like home. Um, I, I absolutely love it. Properties. Why properties? <laughs> it, it, it looks like uh, such a masculine profession. That's what they say. Every time I walk into a room and I, I demand attention, they still look over my shoulder to see where's the guy who's coming in. So how did you navigate yourself into this profession? Did you set out from the onset to do this or did it just happen? No, this is, this is strictly accidental. I, um, when I was in college, I, I worked for a hotel and um, this particular company had a, their retreat, their annual retreat at the property. Mm -hmm. And so um, the HR manager, just, we just kind of sort of struck up a conversation and we started talking and at the end of her their time she was like you're coming to work for me it's like but well, i have no idea i don't know anything how to about deal property with properties management. or how to manage properties she said i will teach you and she did and today I, i'm happy to say it was a good switch in profession definitely not what i went to school for but I like what it. did you go to school for um actually my my undergrad is in business management and marketing um and then grad school i did public administration because I truly wanted to work for the government, but which government? It didn't matter. It is the I, I like policy. I write a lot of policy. Yeah. Um, I, I write a lot actually. Um, so I, I do a lot of policy, um, even for the companies I work for. I do a lot of their manuals. I do a lot of their standard operating procedures. So I, 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 that that was my motivation behind it. But I, I fell in love with property management, and so I said, why not? So you were setting out to do marketing, if you will. I mean, before the property came in, you wanted yes. to do marketing, yes. publicity, probably marketing be a PR somewhere, marketing advertising. advertising. Yeah. And uh, did you envision working for a bank, a food company, a product, a service, corporate body? Did you imagine you would have worked for a Pepsi, a <laughs> Apple, something? Maybe. Um, mostly... Um, this will be a little biased. It was more of advertising of Afrocentrism, meaning, meaning showcasing uh, African heritage and advertising. Mm -hmm. um, I always said my dream job would be to market my country, meaning Gambia, uh, to be uh, a, a, a tourist destination, kind of like uh, Jamaica is. Because oh. everywhere you go, everybody knows about Jamaica. And Jamaica is pretty much geographically um, similar to Gambia. Mm -hmm. And so my dream job would have been to be able to be the person to market Gambia to where mm -hmm. everybody wants to come here. Um, just kind of got a deviation from that, but yeah. I, I think you can still do that. Yes, I'm, I'm sure I can. I just have a lot of other things I'm into, but it's still not late. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I, I think it is the duty of every Gambian yeah. to try as much as we can to sell Destination Gambia, the yes. brand of the country. Yes. The, yes. You know, yes. uh, we have, what, 12 months of really beautiful weather, Indeed. You know, sandy Indeed. beaches all over the country, Indeed. and uh, amazing people. We have amazing yes, people. people. Very tolerant, um, very accepting. Uh, the landscape is beautiful. So, yes, I am. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll start embarking on that too. So, um, why did you decide that the time was right now to come back home and uh, get a foot in? That was not by choice. I, I actually had said I wanted to, mm -hmm. just never had a specific time. Mm -hmm. um, things started happening um, and uh, life got in the way and so we kind of pushed it back a little bit then um, my husband got a job opportunity to come to Senegal and I was like, yep, I guess this is it, we have to go. Mm -hmm. So um, him, he came with the children a year ago and then I ended up a year later uh, because I just had so many other projects I was doing. Uh, a year later, April, I got on a plane and came. 
Pretty good. <laughs> so we now touched a little bit about your profession. We touched a little bit about family, yeah. uh, what you do, why you do what you do. So I think it's a good time for a break. Yes. So viewers will be right back after this very short commercial break. Welcome back, Aida. Thank you. After that break. Um, now let's give this a little bit of personal touch. Okay. Um, we've, I've learned that you're a big fighter <laughs> and uh, you've fought a lot of battles in your life. Yes. Uh, let's start with the smallest battle. Okay. Which battle did you overcome that, will, that gave you the impetus to be able to fight the biggest battle that you fought? The smallest battle would be, in my opinion, breaking into corporate America. Um, as you know, when you, when you, when you travel, um, you go with the, intent, the big ideas, I want to go to school and, and I want to do this and I want to do that, mm -hmm. then other factors come in. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, you know, paying for tuition is expensive, mm -hmm. um, having to go through that. Uh, and then you're working your way up. I, I never wanted to be the girl who just worked at, you know, a, a misery waitress job. That was not me. I had a, a, a focus and a vision of things I wanted to do. Therefore, breaking into corporate America, uh, you have an accent, mm -hmm. um, my name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and everywhere you go, people ask you, where are you from? Mm -hmm. um, you know, even though they know essentially you're the boss, they still go, well, how'd you get your job? Yes. So I, I think that was the smallest, smallest battle, but, um, but it, was, it was good. It was how did you wiggle your way? Because you're talking about difficulty and challenges of doing it, but how did you get into it? Perseverance and not let anything faze me. Um, they, I, I take everything as a learning curve. Uh, I don't uh, hold it against them for asking the questions because they don't know. Mm -hmm. um, people always see you and, and make assumptions, so you have to teach them who you are. Um, yes, you know, my name is, Isatu is my, my, my real name, but, you know, people try to pronounce it and then they give you another name. I'm like, no, my name is Isatu, so you have to pronounce it the way it is. So, you know, it, it's just one of those small things and eventually they'll get it. So, now you're confusing me. Are you Ida <laughs> or are you Isatu? <laughs> Well, it's Aida Trusisi, but everybody calls me Aida, so I, we're going to stick with Aida. So officially you're Aida too? Officially I'm Aida Trusisi, yes. But why are you letting me call you Aida? Because everybody calls me Aida. If you say Aida Trusisi, you're confusing everybody, so just, let's just stick with Aida. Okay, you're not the first Aida Aida too I know. Yeah, so I that know. means this is becoming a common it, it, thing. It is very common, very, very common, yes. Okay, so a lot of Aida are actually Aida. Aida, yes. A lot of Aida's are also Aida yes. In this case. Yes. Yes. Confusing. Very, but it's okay. <laughs> so, let's say now we have a young girl yeah. from Badibu. Just got to the U.S. today. Not Badibu. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> we have a young girl from Badibu who just made it to the U.S. today, who has big dreams of becoming. And this young girl find, uh, met you and is asking, what do I do to make a difference in this big country? First, go to school. I tell my daughter that people are going to judge you by a lot of things. The one thing they cannot judge you on is the fact that you, you, you're not educated. If you stand there with your education, mm -hmm. you speak properly, you carry yourself well. There are a lot of things that they can discount you for. Those are not one of those things. They, I can, you cannot help the fact somebody doesn't like your skin color. You cannot help that somebody doesn't like that you're tall. Um, you cannot discount the fact that you know somebody might just look at you and not like you. But don't let them discount you because you're not worthy. You don't have the merit. You're not educated. Um, or any other thing that you can actually gain. Um, if it's something that you cannot help, then I, I accept that. Just the things that you, you, you have to fight for um, to, 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 to merit where you're standing. And to merit for you is education? Absolutely. To what level? As far as you can take it. I urge girls every day to be the best that they can. Um, 
you don't have to sit in a formal school. You can get certifications. You can, um, you you can you can have a skill. Uh, you can just just as long as it is something that is beneficial to you. Yes, a college degree may not be for everybody, um, but if you if it is, go as far as you can. There is a lot of things that are happening with women in Gambia. Yes, that put women in vulnerable positions. True. Sure. And um, to your advice, guidance, experience, what would you say would give Gambian women greater voice? We have to stick together and we have to make our voice heard. Our biggest problem that I find is we have this thing called it's not a woman's place. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that. I don't believe nothing is not a woman's place. Mm -hmm. This country can be run by a woman. Um, countries are run by a woman. If you ask me, I'll tell you the world can be run by a woman. Um, so the, the saying it's not a woman's place is, is, is not acceptable to me. Um, I feel like uh, as women, we need to come together. We're not just doing this for ourselves, we're doing this for our children. We're doing this for generations to come. And telling a child that it is not a woman's place, you, you're hindering that child. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, we need to come together Anything that is affecting us directly, we need to have a voice, we need to come out, and we need to talk about it. Um, this, this idea of not speaking out is, to me, is, is, is still oppressive. We need, we need to talk about our issues, and we need to stand for things that we believe in. Are you thinking there is some sort of a ceiling somewhere? Absolutely. How Absolutely. do you break the ceiling? By being visible by taking no for an answer and being persistent. You can by tell being me visible, no. if there is a ceiling, there's always a restriction. That's why the ceiling exists. Then I bypass the person who's putting that restriction. Do you think there is a person doing this, or do you think this is a general... Um, it's a cultural issue. Yeah, a cultural issue that has been here for a long time. Absolutely. And that women themselves are also uh, a participant in that culture. They are. But I've met some phenomenal women here that don't take no for an answer. There's a few role models that I have that are, excuse my French, kicking butt and taking names. And, and, and they, are, they are ones to emulate. I don't speak French, so you're all right. <laughs> uh, they, they, and, and, you know, they are, I, I don't want to name any names, but they are people that, they are women that, again, the, the cultural issue is not a problem. They don't take no for an answer and they would go until they can't anymore. And so we as the younger generation of them need to need to do exactly just that and, and follow their footsteps. This new Gambia, a lot of hope. So you coming back home, I was thinking you were going to say, all right, the new dispensation, the new climate, the new everything is the reason why I wanted to come home. So I am a bit disappointed with that. But no. how do you see New Gambia? You shouldn't be. Um, like I said, wanting to come home has been a desire of mine um, for a while. I, I tried, I came in uh, 2010. Mm -hmm. um, I stayed for almost six months. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, back in 2015. And so it's, it's always been testing the waters per se. Um, but uh, the New Gambia encouraged coming home. Um, Mm -hmm. for me to be even here today um, because like I said I write a lot I'm very opinionated so I don't think uh, had it not been New Gambia I wouldn't be sitting here today so I am um, I'm happy that, that, that the new that we have New Gambia and I have a lot of hope I have a lot of hope um, with freedom comes hope um, it's still early in the game mm -hmm. uh, for us to be to be in a tizzy and uproar but I think uh, there's hope. There's a lot of hope. Your expertise is in policy, your expertise is in property management. Uh, what would you ideally want to do? You want to continue consulting? You want to work for public office? You want to do your own firm? You want to work for an agency? What? I'm open, but I like the flexibility of consulting. Um, I have a young family, and so it gives me the chance to be around them um, and so and it also gives me a chance to, to do different things 
Mm -hmm. uh, consulting is 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 one of those things that you you, it's, you say it's consulting, but you really don't have a title because you go in and there's various different things that you do. Um, as far as policy goes, I would love to help our government and 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 offices get formulated as far as operating procedures, as far as policies, as far as rules. Um, it seems like we don't have any of those. Um, things are fly by the, fly by the seat of your pants. Mm -hmm. um, every office is different. Uh, the cultures are different. I believe in standardization, things need to be the same. Um, that way, if I'm not here, you come in, you know exactly what you're doing and you know exactly what you're looking for. I, I, I don't accept not going to an office, oh, the person that you're looking for is not here today, therefore you have to come back. No. Uh, somebody else needs to be able to step in and, and give me what I need or help me um, in, uh, to their capacity. Either we, we now have to go up close and personal. That's okay. We'll now talk about your biggest battle. Yes. What was your biggest battle? <laughs> So in 2013, um, I was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. I, um, I had just started a new job uh, with, with one of the companies that I work for. And um, it was literally less than a month, uh, I felt a lump. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I told a friend of mine, I said, hey, I, I have this weird thing. I thought it was a, it was a, a cyst. Mm -hmm. um, and she's a physician's assistant. So uh, she came over, she looked at it, she was like, ah, it doesn't feel like a fluid, I don't know what it is. Um, but I'll, we'll look at it you know, in another week and we'll see. Mm -hmm. So we met up another week later uh, and she felt it and she was like, ah, it, does, it still doesn't feel fluidy. Because if it's a cyst, it's a fluid and it will pop. And mm -hmm. so she says, you just have to come in to the, to the office and then we'll look at it. If you know anything about the U.S., once you start working for some, somewhere, it takes you about 90 days for your insurance to kick in. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, my insurance is not going to kick in. And this was in July. It's not going to kick in until September, so I'm going to wait. She was like, I don't think we have time to wait. Okay. So I said, that's fine. So I went in. Mm -hmm. um, she, did the, the, she did a scan mm -hmm. um, to just to make sure it was fluid like or not. Then if you have friends that you're really good good friends which you can always tell the demeanor on their face mm -hmm. uh, when she was doing the scan her face changed mm -hmm. so i'm like what's wrong she goes nothing she was like let me just just get a doctor to look at this it was late in the afternoon the office mm -hmm. was already closed but the doctor was still there mm -hmm. so he came in and you know we chit chatted for a little while and then he looked at the scans his face changed i'm like okay what is going on he said we'll just have to do a biopsy and then um and then we'll let you know it's like okay so they did the biopsy this was on a wednesday um, Friday she calls me she goes hey the doctor's been calling you and uh, you're not answering your phone I'm like I was in a meeting all day she was like well where are you so I told her mm -hmm. she goes like well I'm coming to meet you it's like okay mm -hmm. <laughs> so she came um, and when she got there she sent my staff home mm -hmm. um, and uh, she came into my office she, she called the doctor and she said uh, the doctor was like I have something to tell you is it okay if your friend is there I'm like yeah absolutely um, then he told me it was cancer. At that point, I couldn't hear anything else. Mm -hmm. um, all I heard was this cancer, and I'm mm -hmm. like, what am I supposed to do? Like, I just got this new job, I'm supposed to travel, I have these things I need to do. I have kids, I have a husband, I have all these things. I couldn't hear anything else but the fact that cancer was there. Mm -hmm. So uh, she's very gracious enough. She still laughs about it. Uh, she took all the notes, did everything that she needed to do while I was just literally slid under the desk and just started crying. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, from that moment, she, she walked outside. Uh, she called my husband and told him what happened. Um, and I, I said to her, I need to go home. Mm -hmm. uh, she said, okay, I'll drive you. I said, no, 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 I need to drive myself. She goes, I don't think that's a good idea. I'm very stubborn. I said, no, no, no I'm driving myself. So I drove, uh, it's about a 20 minute ride home, and I cried the entire way mm -hmm. until I got home. Uh, when I got there, my kids never run outside. At this point, they were like five. Mm -hmm. They never run outside once, once I parked, but this day they just ran outside. And my daughter was like, what's wrong? I'm like, nothing. She goes, why are you crying? I said, I'm not crying. She goes, yes, you are. 
very persistent too. <laughs> and I said, uh, I have something in my eye. She goes, okay, well, whatever it is, it'll be okay. And at that point I figured, you know, I, I don't have a choice but to fight. Um, and, and so my fight started. Uh, that was July 19th. Uh, because of the whole insurance thing, I had to, to wait uh, to figure out what organizations was going to cover me because I just couldn't, you, you can't afford cancer treatment in the U.S. without insurance. Mm -hmm. And so my friend graciously found this organization that covered my treatments 100%. Mm -hmm. um, so this was the 19th of July. I actually started my treatments um, the 29th. I had a port put in. And then on the 30th is when I started chemo. Well, the kicker part is that when I first, when they did the biopsy and measured the margins, it was a stage two. On the 30th, it had grown to a stage three. Mm -hmm. So had I waited till the September that I was hoping for, I probably won't be sitting here today. Um, but the cancer was so aggressive that I had to, the normal procedure is they take the, the tumor out or the cancer out, mm -hmm. and then you go through chemotherapy and radiation. Well, mine was reversed. Mm -hmm. because the tumor was so aggressive and it was so close to the chest wall, they were afraid um, that it might have spread or, or you know, touch other things. So I had to have chemo for about seven months. Oh. Um, and then after that, uh, we did the surgery um, and, then, and then the radiation. With the chemo was rough. Um, cancer itself doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. It's the treatment that sucks. I have to say, I would not have done it without my family. Mm -hmm. I would not have done it. I have a really, really awesome network of girlfriends, mm -hmm. um, all Gambians. One of them is Liberian, mm -hmm. but they are the most amazing group of females. I, I, I cry sometimes when I think about them because they are so awesome. They never let me, all of my treatments were every 10 days. Um, mm -hmm. One of them, they don't even live in the same state I do. Some of them don't, but they will fly in and go to chemo with me. Um, they were always there. They cooked, they never let me do anything. Um, you are spoiled. <laughs> I have to say so, yes. They are that awesome. Um, and so it, 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 it actually boosts your morale because most people, when you're sick, people leave you alone. And that, that causes other, other issues. Um, but so my fight was, was not alone. Um, they did a, a really good job. And, and today I have to, I, every, everywhere I said, I thank, thank my lucky stars for them. Um, the surgery came um, and I had the option to do a uh, uh, mastectomy, meaning they removed the breast tissue. Mm. I did a lot of research. Um, chances are cancer, if you've had uh, breast cancer in one breast, it will come back 67% of the chance. So I decided not to, to take the chance mm. and I did a double mastectomy. So I had both of my breasts, uh, breasts removed. Um, and then after that healed, I decided to do re reconstruction surgery. Um, and I'm not saying, uh, telling women that that is the best form of, of course of action to take. It was the best for me. Yeah. Like I said, I have a lot of things I'm doing. So having another episode of cancer is just not in my plans. Unless God says it is and it comes back somewhere else. But yes. for that particular part, that 67% was too high for me for, to take the chance. So I just decided to... Do to both, and, do both and, and, and call it a day, yeah. I, I see you are working with other group of women. Yes. And uh, spreading the word, if you will. Yes. And trying to help others who may be and are not even aware. Yes. Of the do's and the don'ts and how early yes. would you have to act, yes. in other words. Yes. Um, usually when we do our private battles, we let them be private. Indeed. What gave you the courage to want to go public with this? You know, that was, a, I, I, I laugh and say it was an epiphany I got. I was on an operating table. And when you're on an operating table, you tend to have this conversation with yourself and God. And I said, God, just please just let me go through this. And I come back on the other side. I promise I will be a good person. <laughs> and I promise. <laughs> And I promised that I, will, I would let other world women know, I would do my social responsibility and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I got out of that successfully. And uh, you know, I, I started the whole, I wanna come home thing started coming back. Mm -hmm. And I started doing research on Gambia as far as cancer treatments and there's absolutely none. So had this happened to me here, I wouldn't have survived. 
So I took it upon myself to start a foundation called uh, Fighting Against Cancer in Africa. Mm -hmm. I'm not limiting it just to Gambia because it's a, it's a, a continental problem. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly my goal is raising awareness, uh, talking to people. I have a, a lot of women that, are, that, that found me on social network or, or heard me speak or something um, and are going through the battles and I take the time to talk to every single one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. whether they go into treatments. If I can be there, I would be there. If not, I would call, uh, check on them. Uh, they have questions. Some of them don't, don't, don't know what to expect. My focus is to get a proper cancer center here in the Gambia uh, with the help of anybody who wants to collaborate. Um, uh, Awaka is doing a great job and, and together, I think, with the help of the government and we're building a cancer center. So these are things that are happening. So I think we're doing a good job. The job doesn't end yet, but uh, I, th I think with perseverance, we, we will get the results that we want. You're focusing a lot on women. Yes. With these machines in town and the cancer center established, yes. are we men Yes. a part of this? Okay, so to break the myth first, I made a mistake I should have said. Cancers in general, but breast cancer is not just a woman problem. Men actually get breast cancer. Really? Uh, yes, they do. Um, about 2,500 men die every year of breast cancer. So most people don't know that. And so I've, I've steady and I get the same reaction you have right now. Um, but when I say a cancer center, it is not just a breast cancer center. It's an inclusive cancer center to treat all cancers. Um, here in the Gambia, the highest uh, uh, cancer that's killing people, especially women, is uh, cervical cancer um, and then breast cancer. And then the men is the hepatitis, the liver cancer, and then prostate cancer. So we want to bring all of these. And I'm, I'm urging people, please talk about it. Because most people in their families, even my own family, when I, when I got my diagnosis, I started asking questions. They were like, well, nobody in our family has it. Well, after digging and asking, come to find out two of my, on my paternal side, and my dad's sisters died of breast cancer, and I lost three cousins to breast cancer. Had I not asked, I would have never known. So I need families to start talking about this because early detection does save lives, and we need to know these things so we know what to look for. Thank you very much, Aida. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Stay blessed. Thanks.